All right, back again. This time we're going to finish off Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit by covering the last two chapters, Religion and Absolute Knowing, which wraps things up pretty well. Uh, even for a book that's quite as scattered as this one, it comes to a decent close. So I'm going to have timestamps for both of those chapters and their big uh, sub-chapters to give anyone a kind of, I don't know, shortcut to any specific part they want to learn about. Uh, you should probably just listen to the whole thing. It would be incredibly ironic for you not to, given that part of the project that Hegel is describing is one of process. You have to move through these phases for, for Hegel to arrive at a thing called absolute knowing or absolute spirit. But before we jump into that, a few things to say. You can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. Um, you can also find my this in podcast form for anyone interested in that on pretty much any um app or site or whatever uh and i want to give a shout out to any of my to my patrons there's james liam nicholas uh ramona and sebastian y'all have been a great help i you know can't imagine doing this without any kind of support and if anyone else wants to help that'd be great if you can't you can't uh anything else probably not probably but probably not uh without further ado then let's jump right into it so the first chapter here we're going to discuss, which is the penultimate one, penultimate meaning the one before the last one, uh, is religion. So when we're thinking about religion here, Hegel is going to kind of discuss many different various kinds of religions that come kind of pre uh, in the pre-Christian tradition, or, you know, I guess before Christ or before Christianity really develops. But he's not overly specific about that in the text. This is just something that you can kind of uh, gather by reading any secondary information that can shed light on some of the things that he's saying. So for that reason, I really want to stick with the text, so I'm just going to kind of present it in Hegel's terms, but I will make kind of vague references to some of the religions that he's referring to. That to just kind of give an understanding of what's going on. So he's going to look at these religions like a, like a process as a kind of development to, you know, absolute religion. So prior to this point, of course, for those that have been listening, we've been pr concerned primarily with things that happen on earth. And it was only at the end of the last chapter, the end of spirit, when we began to discuss the possibility of faith and what faith might mean. So religion serves a function for Hegel. And for that reason, there are certain people who might want to think that in Hegel's text here, we have a roadmap for a kind of, I don't know, Christian dogma, uh, kind of conservative approach to philosophy. Now, I am not the last word on this by any stretch of the imagination, but reading this text, you really get the impression that while Hegel is clearly religious, and he did spend a lot of time in a seminary, uh, he does appreciate um, philosophy over religion. It's almost like he's trying to find a way to make philosophy make sense um, with religion rather than trying to find a way to bring religion into the fold. So religion is kind of like a supplement here, not the end goal. And that's clear toward the end when he says like, yeah, religion is on its own. It's pretty much devoid of thought. Uh, so yeah, we're going to get to that, but I think these are some preliminary things that are worth mentioning just to give you an idea of what's going to be happening here. Now, of course, this discussion of religion cannot go without discussing God or absolute being. And prior to this point, absolute being was reserved as a kind of, um, I don't know, subject of the imagination. It didn't actually have a kind of being in and for itself, the self-conscious uh, or, or having self-consciousness of spirit. So, so far, we've only kind of seen absolute being through our minds, right? We haven't yet allowed it to recognize itself as spirit and thereby recognizing its otherness to some extent that is separate from us, but that we can eventually galvanize with ourselves by negating the negation. Now, what must happen for spirit to embody religion and vice versa what would be to complete the perfection of religion. We must not only, uh, or it's not only to say that religion concerns itself with spirit's reality, 
But conversely, that spirit as self-consciousness, spirit becomes actual to itself, an object of its consciousness. So this is what we need to see occurring, because if spirit just exists for us, it's as though it's something we can draw upon, this imaginary field that can give us, you know, a kind of momentum, but that does not yet have its own kind of identity, doesn't have its own recognition of itself, then it's going to be, I guess, evacuated of the potential that we might associate with it. And that this is essentially the process of making spirit more than just picture thought or representation for religion. Now, it's here that Hegel starts to kind of turn his gaze back onto the project that's been conducted so far. So the subsequent phases we've gone through from, you know, consciousness to self-consciousness and reason and then and spirit. He says we shouldn't see those things as being like, like a telos, right? Like these things are something that we have to move through to arrive at this point called spirit or absolute spirit. He says instead, we must recognize them as not fully arriving at immediate spirit, nor yet having consciousness of spirit itself, but that between these different planes, that is between the plane of consciousness and self-consciousness, reason and spirit, we must recognize that there is spirit is always kind of on the horizon. And it is our job, maybe as the phenomenological observer, to then negate that supposed negation, the thing that separates them, their, I don't know, their splits, to then posit their similarity in the overarching project of spirit or identity of spirit. Now we have to do this so that none of these moments as consciousness, self-consciousness, spirit or reason, just attain a totality in themselves. So I want to read a little part here where he says this. So it is the depth of spirit that is certain of itself, which does not allow the principle of each individual moment to become isolated and to make itself a totality within itself. On the contrary, gathering and holding together all these moments within itself, it advances within this total wealth of its actual spirit, and all its particular moments take and receive in common into themselves the like determinateness of the whole. So it's in this way that we see the entire process as a, oh, sorry, that was loud. We see the entire process as, as a totality, not as these individual segments that are part of like a, like a maybe a, a process or a telos. So one of the ways that we can kind of galvanize this totality is by recognizing that even the very process of moving, that is, the very phases themselves, are all indicative of spirit's identity, that is, the identity of moving, being non-lifeless, being part of, you know, the self-movement that, you know, opposites distinctions that can then be, I guess, in a sense, dialectically circumvented, can be internalized, and so on and so forth. So in that way, what we once perceived as being a difference, anything between consciousness, self-consciousness, reason, or, uh, or spirit, we can then find that common ground, that kind of underlying trend that brings them all together. But this is, doesn't complete the project, because we still have to move through religion. In fact, we have to move, because we have to account for absolute being in here, for Hegel, we have to move through three phases of religion. And I say phases, you know, maybe don't get so caught up on whether or not these things happen in order, but they are three different kind of ways that our relationship to God, to the divine, to, you know, transcendence might occur. And these three phases are um, the nature of religion or religious nature, the religion of art or art religion, and then finally Revealed religion. So I want to say something about each of these quickly before we go into each. So the first one, nature, or the religion of nature, or nature religion, is concerned with consciousness and a kind of universal substance. So at this level, we're not going to develop into subjects. That'll come in the next, um, in the next phase. For now, this is dealing primarily with universality, kind of basic truth. Then we move into the religion of art or art religion where we see self-consciousness emerge. So here we're going to be interested in, in, in individuality, subjects, anything like that. And then finally, the revealed religion is going to be a bringing, it's going to bring both together where we're going to see 
the universality and the particularity coming together under this kind of mutual form. Now, if this sounds familiar, as it probably does from the previous chapter discussing transition into, you know, from the ethical to the, to the moral, or ethical to culture and then to, to morality, then you're right, because these things recur over and over and over again in these different spheres. And that's almost each of these chapters is concerned with the various movements from a kind of universality to a universality and a subjectivity being blended together. But they never come to their completion. Only at the end of the book do they actually find their way to their completion. But here we go. We'll start now with the nature of religion, religious nature, or even more simply, natural religion. Now here we're almost taking a big step back to the idea of sense certainty. So here we're going to be concerned with things in the world as they just kind of appear, as though they're, that's all they are. The world is just an objective mass of things that we encounter and experience. So other people are just things we encounter and experience. There's no particularity, like things just are for us. So now what he says about that, and this is a little bit later on, but I just want to read this little sentence first. He says, substance here alienates itself from itself and becomes self-consciousness. So what we're going to see is that in a complete kind of totality of, of universality or a kind of um, you know basic homogenization of things in the world, what we see is a necessity emerge that tries to circumvent that, to move into self-consciousness. Now here he's going to begin to move through various different religions around the world to show how they, and it's hard not to get the sense that he's saying like, oh, these like primitive religions that don't yet understand the power of, um, I guess, God in relation to subjects, in relation to the universal. But anyways, he moves through each of these, starting with the subsection titled God as Light. Now this refers to I guess Persian, the idea here, uh, religions, which is, I guess, the idea that w everything God touches, which is light, so everything, is kind of infiltrated with its essence, to put it quite simply. Now, subjects don't have very much room here because there's just like an, uh, a, a kind of bombardment, bombardment, bombardment of the world and of all people with this kind of idea that, you know, God, this omnipresent thing uh, is where the light always touches. And this imagery for Hegel is quite interesting because he says, okay, well, what we're seeing here is that we're concerned or they're concerned primarily with um, its determinations, which are only concerned with ascending without now in his words, descending into the depths to become a subject. Now, this imagery, I think, is important because what we would assume of a certain depthness is a lack of light. So it's exactly where that lack of light occurs that Hegel sees the subject residing. So he continues here in this, this other quote. Uh, he says that this immediate being, this unconstrained life, must determine itself as being for self by sacrificing its pure light, which goes everywhere so that the individual may take an en enduring existence. So that is the duty of this kind of religious dynamic to kind of allow subjectivity to emerge by sacrificing its light. Now, while this might appear to be have a like a direct relationship to the idea of sense certainty, where, you know, all things are reduced to, to being just about the product of pure sense, Hegel says that, no, it's, it's a lot more refined than just, you know, quote unquote, primitive humans looking at things in the world and experiencing them. Like, this already implies that certain stages have been gone through, have been traversed through, to arrive at a point where they are sufficiently developed to have a thing called religion. So in that way, he says that it shouldn't be confused with sense certainty, because it is actually, in his words, filled with spirit. Now we move from here to what is just called the plant and animal subchapter, which is dealing with Indian religion, probably. Hinduism, probably more specifically, coming from the Vedic tradition, uh, to now he you know thinks he he can speak about, but here we go. And he says in this kind of dynamic, 
spirit has uh, now withdrawn into itself from the shapeless essence. So the shapeless essence being that, you know, light that is just permeates everywhere, doesn't have a kind of face. Um, and that this is primarily the religion of spiritual perception. Now, I should add that in the previous subchapter here, God is light, that we can kind of draw a similarity to the idea of the ethical being in under the state formation because they, they are reduced. They don't have an identity. And it's kind of like the state with, the, with its laws that turn these people into legal subjects permeates, kind of sends its light out, casting it over the people and homogenizing them with that kind of spectral light. Now, sorry, I digress. To come back here to the plant and animal one, Hegel says, interestingly, that um, in this situation, what we see happen is the people kind of fall apart into a numberless multiplicity of weaker and stronger, richer and poorer spirits, which we can draw another parallel between this and the way he spoke about culture as being the move beyond the ethical, where culture is this kind of amalgamation of all these chaotic movements by anyone who feels like they can take control, anyone who thinks that they can be the top dog. And by virtue of that, we see a you know kind of crumbling of the social organization. Now, he further kind of delineates how we arrive at this point by suggesting that this is a movement from what he calls the flower religion to uh, a religion of the animal. And the animal religion or I should say, actually, the flower religion is concerned with a kind of passivity and impotence of contemplative thinking, whereas the animal religion is a destructive being for self, which, you know, that's what this subchapter is about, being about uh, plants and animals. So we see that happening here, and I guess the illusion makes sense because, you know, in the Vedic tradition, there is an association with um, animals in, in, in many of the, uh, the myths, also with plants, like Soma, for example. And he says that this movement from the flower to the animal is uh, kind of an almost a natural one because he says that plant life is really indifferent. Plant life doesn't care about other beings. It just, it just exists. Now, he says that that kind of creates a, a, a problem, a general degree of anxiety among people that are starting to recognize a worthiness behind being, you know, individual subjects. And so the, ne the next kind of logical step would be to look at other natural things, i.e. animals, that give a certain quality of independence where each in their being for self, you know, the animal, the, the strongest will survive type thing, that opens up the door for a kind of destructive being for self that he's describing here. Now, because this is such a destructive thing, it then tries to resolve itself, and it resolves itself in the form of the artificer that he now describes in the next subchapter. So the artificer is kind of like a mechanic, I guess, a kind of like proletarian figure that is interested in producing. So the spirit artificer for Hegel seeks to undo the division between the soul and body by giving shape to soul in its own self and to endow body with soul. And in so doing, it turns plant and animal life away from its positions, away from their positions, and makes them useful for, you know, the soul, or for spiritual life more generally. So in the actions of this artificer, what we see developing is the kind of spirit consciousness in, in relation to religion, but it is one that's still relatively undeveloped because there's still a clear divide between, you know, a self, on the, an outer self, and a dark kind of inner self where, you know, maybe the soul might exist. So there must be a kind of way for, him, for the artificer to, in Hegel's words, break out into the language of a profound but scarcely intelligible reason. So th there's still a fear of a general kind of selfness. So we, we were associating with this light, we were associating with this plant and animal life, we were associating with this kind of like architect, maybe like a religious figure that stands in for something else. And that through this, we see an expression or we see the outer self retreat into itself 
so going into those dark recesses, while the inner self expresses itself out of itself, that is, it comes out into the spectral light of day and into its own self. And it is here that we see the emergence of the spirit as artist, where we see art emerging in this in this field, where art will come to be something that stands in, is, is a representation of the artist. So they are able to then contemplate themselves as a self. Now, I say that, and we're going to trouble it a little bit, so it's just a kind of preliminary preface to what we'll discuss. So here we arrive at the chapter, or the subchapter, Religion in the Form of Art. So this is going to be indicative of the shift from, as I described it earlier, from substance to subject. So I want to read a little section here that'll kind of reveal that. So through the religion of art, spirit has advanced from the form of substance to assume that of subject. For it produces its outer shape, thus making explicit in it the act of the self-consciousness that merely vanishes in the awful substance and does not apprehend its own self in its trust. And so it is here that self-consciousness will come to alienate, alienate itself from itself and give itself the nature of a thing or essentially make itself a universal self, which might be laying the foundation for anyone that's been listening for the thing of, called spirit that completely disturbs a split between universal and individual or the self. Now, okay, so into this, in the, into the subchapter here. So here we see the artificer has been essentially blended. Their inner and outer components have come together, which, which kind of marks them now as what Hegel calls a spiritual worker, where they have the capacity to rec recognize themselves as embodying something other than just their simple corporality. That is more than just their body, right? So they're able to say, what is it that essentially makes me tick? What is it that binds me with other people? Now this ushers in for Hegel an ethical or true spirit that isn't made up of a lord and master or caste system, but is essentially, in his words, a free nation in which hollowed custom constitutes the substance of all, whose actuality and existence each and everyone knows to be his own will and deed. Now it's coming into actuality here, right? It's, it's becoming real, tangible. We can see it happening. And by virtue of that, Hegel is clear that we, we aren't yet at a kind of absolute religion because we're, we're still kind of stuck on earth. But very much like the last chapter, when we were talking about the ethical realm and how there are people that grow discontent with it, Hegel says that while this is happening, while this ethical realm is occurring, this kind of free nation of individuals, spirit is sitting on the sidelines waiting for its opportunity to say, but remember, everyone, you are your own individual. Do not let them, you know, uh, tell you what to do, who to be or anything. And by virtue of that, spirit, interestingly, transcends the kind of realm of actuality, the realm of reality, precisely because we have been so indoctrinated into reality as a thing that is constituted, constitutive of um, a free nation of kind of, of ethical principles and whatnot. So spirit, in refuting that, in negating it, moves outside of that realm of reality, giving it this kind of divine essence. And as such, spirit attains a new self, a new identity for itself. And now we're going to begin into three more subchapters in this subchapter dealing with the religion and the work of art. So this sub subchapter titled The Abstract Work of Art is going to be concerned with the production of art like statues that stand in for gods or, or represent the gods, maybe. He's not incredibly clear here, but we're going to, you know, do with what we have. Now, these icons, these statues that are erected by uh, an artist, kind of operate at first as counter mirrors because the artist produces them. And Hegel says, and this is quite interesting, he's like, when someone produces a work of art, what they get back, they get back in the form of the praise because the, the work of art does not give them anything itself. What they get back comes in the form of praise from spectators and other, other people. Now, Hegel says that there's a kind of split between the work that was put into it, 
and the praise that is returned. Because the work that was put into it was grueling. So if there was an equivalence, what Hegel recognizes is that what the person would get back would be a kind of grueling response, but it's not. So in that way, the artist kind of loses themselves. They, and this is something, I don't know if Marx writes about this specifically, but certainly Marxists or Marx's idea about uh, alienation from one's labor can be applied here, where the artist is then dissociated from the work they produce because it's no longer theirs. What they, their relationship with it has now been kind of altered because of the relation of other spectators to that work of art. So anyways, um, this work of art is primarily dull for Hegel. This work of art is lifeless. It doesn't really have a kind of self-consciousness about it. It is just, it's just there. It's a non-moving thing. But this dullness is kind of undercut by a certain determination that is assumed within a kind of cultural paradigm that sees that work of art, if it stands in for God, because of everything everyone knows about God, it is then bestowed with a kind of quality. It then comes to take on a kind of individuality, kind of self-consciousness. Whereas the artist, being lost in that dynamic, takes on a kind of universal property. They are just the thing that produces this, this wonder. Now, so Hegel looks is here looking at the statue and says, can the statue, as a, as a work of art, actually give us this thing called like absolute religion? He says no, right? It's pretty clear. But then he's like, well, well, let's consider another kind of form of art. Let's take singing. Like singing, the example that we might think of, although he's speaking about something slightly different here, but singing in like a church. For example, if you come from that background, you'd know all about it. So if you sing in a church, you're among others that are all in the service of this singing thing. So you kind of give over your individuality for this 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 fleeting moment, right? That is the sung word. So this vanishing property of singing presents a new problem where he says that speech, which has an emphasis on subjectivity, is vanishing. It's always fleeting, whereas the statue is essentially too objective and it's just kind of frozen in place. But when these two things come together, that is when speech is matched with a kind of um, objective statue-like thinghood, what we see is the emergence of the cult, or the religious cult for Hegel. And it is the job of the cult for Hegel to kind of mediate the pure divine being's dissension and, and unity with reality. So by singing, you know, bringing God to, to earth, or by making the statue, you know, you're making God a kind of physical th property or physical thing on this earth, which then gives it a kind of face. Now, as God begins to be associated with objects and things that can vanish and disappear and be destroyed, Hegel decides to talk about the act of sacrifice. So if a relic is sacrificed as a sign of kind of defying God or sacrificing God, whatever example you could think of there, um, then Hegel says that what that reveals is that God has already been sacrificed because God has been taken from their position, that is this divine, extra-terrestrial, extra-corporal uh, being, into this physical object, which was already an act of sacrificing God. It was already an act of um, kind of removing God from its position, for a kind of greedy humanity that wanted to control it, make it theirs. So then we, you know, we see God everywhere, you know, you go into churches, God is adorned and, and worshipped in the street, that Hegel is like, well, that this is all, it's just superficial. Like, it, this isn't an actual connection to the divine. This is just something that we do to make ourselves feel like we have that connection, which is kind of dominated by picture thinking, or by representation, by statue making that doesn't you know, demand of us to really work toward a relationship with the divine or with God. So then that propels us here into the next subchapter titled The Living Work of Art. And it is here that he says that it is in the act of the religious cult coming to terms with their kind of own positionality in relation to their making of God, 
in these statues. They're kind of um, worshiping God that they enter some degree of self-consciousness. And this comes about when they are satisfied with their own existence. But this self-consciousness, this kind of spirit that we find here, is for Hegel still only immediate spirit, the spirit of nature. So this is not, um, this spirit has not yet sacrificed itself as a self-conscious spirit, which would be necessary for it to recognize itself as its own, you know, other, as its own exterior. Oh, and these sections, they move so fast and Hegel doesn't, I, I don't know what happened when he was writing this book, but like toward the end, he just speeds up. Where before he took all liberties he could to just write about as much as he wanted. Whereas here, I felt like he was, he was on the clock or something and he really had to pump this chapter out. But he says that, so we have this kind of emerging self-consciousness, but this emerging self-consciousness is not quite good enough. In fact, when we see this kind of religious cult be extended into a kind of national sphere, one that encapsulates a whole plethora of individuals or myriad of individuals, what we see is the consciousness of a universality of all human existence emerging. So instead of it being just about, you know, a, an esoteric special group on its own, it is then extended to an entire, you know, nation that includes many more people. And it is that shift that suddenly the question about what connects people, what is it that is universal among selves, among identities, can, can be asked, can be posed. And here we move now into the third subchapter, the spiritual work of art. So I want to read a little passage here from, from later on that I think captures this well. So he says that in this, the reality of the ethical spirit is lost. And having lost all content, the spirits of natural individuals are gathered into a single pantheon, not into a pantheon of picture thought whose powerless form lets each spirit go its own way, but into the pantheon of abstract universality, of pure thought, which disembodies them and imparts to the spirit, spiritless self, to the individual person, a being that is in and for itself. So we have this emergence here of a kind of national spirits, all these people being recognized in their own selves. And it is with this, he says, that we see the emergence of heaven, interestingly enough. So let me just read that. Now, I believe this is the first time he mentions heaven in this book. I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it is. Where he says that the pure intuition of itself as universal humanity has, in the actuality of the national spirit, this form, that is, the national spirit combines with the others, which with which it can, constitutes through nature a single nation in a common undertaking, and for this task forms a collective nation and therewith a collective heaven. And that's between the pages 439 and 440 in my version, in case anyone's curious. Now he says that this is still only a synthetic linking together of self-consciousness and external existence. So while we might see the roots of a kind of absolute spirit emerging, we're still kind of caught in this split between, you know, self-consciousness and um, this externality. So this external existence for him is, is, is actually language. So that finds its place in the epic, that is the epic tale, like, I don't know, I think of the Iliad or Odyssey or something, where which contains the universal content of the world, not yet the universality of thought. So here we're still concerned primarily with things that we see, things that exist in the world, not something pure like thought. And I'm using impure in the in the way that Kant used it as being detached from all experience. So pure, um, again, analytic judgment or whatever. So to kind of think about the Iliad for a moment, anyone familiar with that book or that, that tale is familiar with the fact that there are both humans and gods. Now the humans have a kind of homogenous quality as being humans and the gods have a homogenous quality in that they're gods. And there are certain things expected of each. So the gods expect certain things from humans and humans expect certain things from the gods. But those expectations aren't always met. So there are these particular instances that kind of trouble the whole dynamic where gods might act out, and out of turn or humans might act out of turn that for Hegel kind of signal this coming together of the universal and the particular. And then, of course, there are these heroes that stand out above all the rest. 
Now he contrasts this with the tragedy, the tragic play or something, where the hero, he says, is himself the speaker who conveys to an audience that know their rights and purposes. So here we have a, a connection now, not only among the people within the, 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 the epic, but we're seeing now a connection between the people within the story and the people in the audience, in the, the people that consume the story. And in this instance, in the tragic play, the person uh, makes more use of language than just to essentially convey an external aspect of their selves or of their resolves, sorry. They give utterance to the inner essence as well. So we can't fool ourselves. This audience that they're speaking to is still a, they're a homogenous mass, right? They, they're being, um, they're entering into this play to some extent, into the play of relations between being for self and being for, uh, being in itself, being for other. They're still though, a, a kind of quiet mass that just passively receives this information. And still in the tragedy, in the play, selfness is kind of bestowed upon people. Selfness is not, for Hegel, here the mediating factor of the movement itself. And he says, interestingly, and I don't, I don't know why, uh, it, and I did, you know, some research on it, but he says that this is kind of held together by, by the will of Zeus. And I should know, but I don't really know why. So if anyone does, um, well, here, I'll just say more about what he says about that. So he says, essentially, that Zeus kind of fills the audience with fear. And it is, uh, therefore, the duty of the hero on stage to trouble this unity, splitting itself, that is self-consciousness, between the mask and actor. So they, the person on stage then says, look, I am kind of a living contradiction. I exist both as this mask-wielding non-self, that is a self that's been bestowed upon me, and I am also a self that is my persona, like who, my personality, who I am. And in so doing, the tragic actor is effective at disturbing the, the split or the distance between the spectator and the audience, or the spectator and the actor, because the actor reveals themselves too to be in a position of just a kind of passive receptivity. They are simply taking the orders of the director, for example. They, they are just being who they are told to be just like the audience is told to shut up and listen, to just be there. So in this, the audience is confronted with a possible individuality. Now this shouldn't be surprising. In all the other previous movements, individuality threatens to enter and to disturb a kind of order that is made present here. And we'll talk about order a bit uh, in a bit as well. But in this, we see a split between a kind of chorus. So the chorus is that moment in the play when, you know, someone addresses directly the audience and rational thinking, where the chorus is kind of indicative of um, kind of is a kind of didact, like this is what you must do, whereas rational thinking is indicative of a kind of individuality. And with rational thinking, we see the chorus kind of experience a crisis. So this rational thinking for Hegel kind of elevates gods from the stage, you know, because they somehow occupied that space, back into a kind of abstract dimension of the beautiful and the good. So in effect, they become empty. They become empty concepts that, you know, like Kant was critical of. They become things that are just for pure speculation. They don't actually have any stake in the world. So with this emerging individuality, then gods vanish. Now here we get into the next subchapter, Revealed Religion. So the, the emerging uh, individuality that we just witnessed is now put into contact with the total substance or universality that we saw in the first phase, that is the natural religion. So here he says that both previous movements, uh, in his words, or they unite so that spirit is simultaneously consciousness of itself as its objective substance and simple self-consciousness communi communing with itself. Now here we see re-enter the problem that was pre presented earlier in one of the previous episodes, previous chapters, with the unhappy consciousness. So the unhappy consciousness is, is the thing that, you know, having moved through skepticism and stoicism, uh, is the thing that is left knowing there's more to the world, but not having the kind of capacity to get there, to 
be in the world. And by virtue of that, essentially being satisfied with its position of ineptness. So where's the tragic or he also mentioned the comic um, actor welcomed gods, but was, you know, essentially satisfied with their position, w- just welcoming the gods, not actually understanding or grasping it. Now, the un- whereas, and previously the unhappy consciousness repudiated the gods. We're seeing that kind of tension reemerge now. So the, the tragic actor in welcoming the gods then troubles, I guess, their own relationship to themselves because they put themselves in a kind of lifeless position that is satisfied with that kind of act. And with this satisfaction, suddenly our old relics of our relationship to the gods, like statues, now they become only stones, which is bad because it essentially takes away what uh, Hegel says in our, what we would have gotten if we had a proper connection to the gods. We lose the opportunity to come to its perfect truth and fulfillment, or consciousness loses its opportunity to come to its perfect truth and fulfillment. And it is against this that spirit stands idly by saying, I must intervene now. I must say no. These these are not just stones. Like, the gods exist. We cannot lose our connection to that. And so the, the spirit kind of emerges again to rest uh, these stones from lifelessness, to kind of welcome the gods once again, which in uniting the two, what we see is that the substance is itself, self-consciousness. It becomes self-conscious. Or the universal becomes particular, the universal self. But this spirit is still quite detached from actuality and pure thought. It is still something that kind of exists on its own for purely a kind of imagination. And we, what we must do then to circumvent this problem is for Hegel, um, the objective must possess intrinsic being must originally appear in consciousness as stemming from the notion or the concept. So this is up to the duty of absolute spirit, where self-conscious being is actual in the believer. So it's not something that exists out there. It's not something that, you know, we can completely detach ourselves from. It is imminent to the believer in this case. And as such, consciousness does not then need to go into the netherworld to find God. It can, um, it then learns that the existence of God or its existence is immediately present. So now in Hegel's words, he says that God is sensuously and directly beheld as a self, as an actual individual. Only so is this God self-consciousness. And that God as self-consciousness is, is the simple content of absolute religion. So it's still only a simple content. We aren't, we aren't fully there yet, but we're seeing... The, the roots, I feel like I've said that like 10 million times. If you read the book, you'll know. Hegel's like, here, we've arrived. Ah, no, we haven't. Sorry, got to wait a little longer. Um, but yeah, okay, here, we're setting the stage. So when God is actually elevated to the level of self-consciousness, it allows for a kind of democratic principle to emerge. And I use that term kind of colloquially. Uh, so it allows self-consciousness to essentially be recognized in an other So signaling a kind of decimation of all previous distinctions. Because if God is made to be self-consciousness, and I recognize someone else's self-consciousness, suddenly they are not, you know, completely distinct from I. In fact, we both have this kind of divine enterprise within us. So when God comes down from the abstract into the actual, it it doesn't reach its lowest point. This isn't its most, like, kind of um, base existence. It is instead its highest point for Hegel. It reaches its absolute point when it is effectively real. And this is for him why he calls it revealed religion, because it's for God that is present as spirit. So this is still problematic for him because we have not yet, in his words, elevated God to the form of thought itself, of the notion of the notion, or the notion as notion, or the concept as concept. So what does that mean? Well, still it's something that is removed from us. We have not yet understood or grasped the fact, and this can only happen through absolute knowing, that God, as self-consciousness, 
is what is always already there to some extent. It is what gives absolute possibility to concept that and we can only think right through these kind of concepts or they are what bind things together. And so in negating the negation, we posit the similarities between all things and we find that once we we've done that process enough times or we've elevated it beyond the kind of immediacy of sense certainty enough, we then see the overall picture. And it is up to, and it's quite interesting, he says, spirit essentially only becomes its own self-consciousness for Hegel in the life of the community. And that is essentially because when spirit is brought into actuality, it becomes alien to itself. Because so far, we've only known spirit to be this kind of abstract thing that exists outside of us. When it is given a kind of actuality, it allows for world to be created because that is what it takes for people to have an engagement with among themselves, with others, and with the world that can allow for world to emerge. Otherwise, it's just like animals, which is obviously problematic. But, and this is, you know, plagues the history of philosophy, but like animals lack a certain quality whether it be Dasein, you know, a certain degree of being, or um, a kind of certain connectiveness. I think in many ways that is what Hegel is saying here in drawing a distinction between animal life that is still is pretty base-like for him, even if some of us, myself included, would disagree. I think that is what he's, he's getting at here. So what this does in recognizing self or self-consciousness or... Um, marking essentially the notion of the transcended individual self that is absolute being, which establishes this community, which now returns it to itself as a self, what we see is a move beyond picture thinking here into self-consciousness. So spirit is now, in his words, universal self-consciousness. It is its community. And that's on 473. Now again, he pulls the rug out from under us and says, we are still bound because we have not yet fully come to this realization we live it we we experience spirit we experience this community we are within it but we do not yet have the kind of capacity to think it to understand it as the totalizing function here or to make it into an absolute being for self and it's from here then we move into the next chapter the last one absolute knowing so it's here that we're going to move beyond picture thinking and deposit things as existing for themselves, but also for self-consciousness uh, that will link all the previous movements that we might from observing them externally, like we were in observing reason, just seeing things and trying to draw some kind of faint connections between them, which failed, obviously. Now we're going to try to find the thing that galvanizes, brings it all together. So this can begin to happen when we get when we recognize the thing, not as necessarily thought or something that is thought, but is actually recognized as a shape of consciousness. Now, I would also like to say that this chapter is involves a lot of recap. So while the chapter is maybe um, 15 pages or so, I don't comment on everything because it is just a lot of um, a summary of essentially what the whole book was doing, which I don't think is totally necessary to go over again. So I'm just going to talk about the things that are kind of original here. So with this, he says we're, we've arrived through all these different phases to absolute knowing. So he defines it as the spirit, which at the same time goes its complete or gives its complete and true content, the form of the self and thereby realizes its notion as remaining in its notion in this realization and that's on 485 and it is with this that we see science emerge for hegel it, it's only through this process um, and he's very clear that science only emerges at this point and this is on page 486 that he makes that very clear so what science does because it is essentially an extension of this logic is it is, is that it unites the objective form of truth and of the knowing self in an, in an immediate unity. That's on 491. So he says that the science of knowing in the sphere of appearance, which is phenomenology, is what spirit mobilizes in its continual 
or the, this is, these are my words, is what spirit mobilizes in its continual return and flight to and from actuality, each time it enters at a higher level ad infinitum. So now spirit, having taken on a quality of um, recognizing all that is within experience to be known and true as being under the umbrella of self-consciousness, of absolute spirit, what we see then is a kind of... Um, in the various movements of spirit, that is, it's coming from the abstraction to actuality, existing on the world stage as being both the totalizing function of self-consciousness and also these, this kind of driving factor that troubles even that self-consciousness and allows for newness to emerge, allows for science to emerge. In these processes, we're always arriving at these higher levels for Hegel. So it's always a development. And this goes on ad infinitum. So then, therefore, what religion in the previous chapter had only kind of speculated, now science brings into reality. It makes it part of the world. Oh, God. Okay. That's pretty well it. <laughs> like, if anyone actually listened to all of these, I applaud you. Um, and if you're, you know, willing to teach me about things, I would, I would love it. I've just read it and I've read a bunch of secondary stuff. Um, and there are a lot of great resources. I mean, if you're not familiar, uh, Gregory Sadler, Gregory B. Sadler is the YouTube, uh, channel. He goes through each one of the paragraphs and it takes him like half an hour every two paragraphs. I don't know. He's like, it's going to take him like, like 200 hours more more it's going to take him longer to do just that than all of the content i have on my channel for all the books like so if you want a good resource definitely check out his stuff you probably know about it because why you wouldn't know about me and not know about him but anyways um if i did anything wrong i would love to hear about it if you're willing to put in that labor but if not i'll catch you next time take care <laughs>